In early 1985, EMI was set to release an album of unreleased Beatles material for the first time, called Sessions. But just weeks before it went to the presses, the Beatles shut it down, and it would be another 10 years before anything from that album would be officially released. I'm Andrew from Parlogram, and in this video, we'll look in depth at the story of the Sessions album, from concept to cancellation, and how it became the Beatles' biggest selling bootleg. Well known to Beatles fans and collectors for nearly 40 years, the Sessions album has become one of the most widely owned Beatles bootlegs. It was also the first Beatles bootleg album I ever owned, and is one I've been fascinated with ever since. So it was with great interest a few weeks ago that I noticed an original EMI press kit for the album for sale at a UK auction house. It appears to have been put up for sale by EMI's former head of public relations, Brian Savile and comprised a fascinating collection of documents, photos and transparencies, which not only told the story of the album, but answered many questions about it too. Ever since the Beatles' original recording contract with EMI had come to an end in January 1976, EMI had been keen to put out some unreleased Beatles recordings. They knew they had some, but they weren't exactly sure what they had or where they were. Like many media archives in the mid-70s, Abbey Road's tape library was in a bit of a mess, so EMI's executives decided to sit down and listen to all the Beatles' unreleased material. But because they focused their listening solely on unreleased songs, they completely ignored hundreds of hours of tape containing rehearsals, demos and alternate takes, and, as a result, finished up with just 10 titles they considered worthy of release. These unreleased tracks soon began circulating around the EMI office on in-house cassettes. And it wasn't long before one of these cassettes fell into the hands of the bootleggers. One of the results being this album called File Under Beatles. Work to begin cataloguing the Beatles master tapes began seriously in 1981, when an Abbey Road engineer named John Barrett was given the task of going through every single reel in the library and log exactly what was on them. Barrett, who was at the time terminally ill with cancer and would pass away in February 1984, threw himself completely into the task and, using a series of notebooks and multicoloured spreadsheets, created a detailed catalogue of the contents of each reel of tape. Now, for the first time, EMI could see exactly what they had, but the next issue was, when and how could they release it? In September 1981, the Daily Mirror published this story about the Beatles' secret song. The song in question was Leave My Kidden Alone, which, as the article states, was planned for release the previous year, but was shelved after John's murder. The article quoted an EMI spokesman as saying, There is other unfinished recorded material of the Beatles which has never been released, but Kitten is the only complete track. He also added, we don't need anybody's permission to release the record because it was made for us before Apple took over the Beatles' activities. With hindsight, that was all complete nonsense, as EMI would later find out to their cost. In late 1982, buoyed by the success of the re-released Love Me Do single, EMI released the Beatles Singles Collection box set. Although containing no unreleased tracks, it did contain the first fruits of Barrett's research in the form of an insert included with the box. This, for the first time, detailed not just each single's release date, but the recording dates of all the songs too. A few months later, in December that year, EMI did consider releasing Leave My Kitten Alone as a single, but decided the time wasn't right and the idea was shelved. During early 1983, Barrett began unearthing more and more quality unreleased tracks, which prompted some serious brainstorming at EMI about exactly how they could release this material to the public. News about unreleased Beatles tracks surfaced again in early July 1983, when it was reported that four previously unheard Beatles tracks could soon be released as singles. The newly revealed songs were That Means A Lot, If You Have Got Trouble, How Do You Do It, and leave my kitten alone. Quoting Brian Southall, the article finishes by saying, quote, The Beatles are aware of the four new tracks and I'm sure they will eventually be released. 
This article from The Sun from July the 9th says that the tracks were found when the studio was being redecorated. And it was that redecoration that gave EMI the opportunity to release those tracks to the public for the first time. The Beatles' Live at Abbey Road ran for eight weeks between July the 18th and September the 11th and was the first time the studios had been open to the general public. The highlight of the show was a two-part video presentation narrated by DJ Roger Scott, which included rare archive footage along with some of the newly discovered unreleased material. The event was a huge success, but came at some cost to EMI, for during the preparations for the show, some of the tapes were copied, allegedly by Roger Scott, and subsequently ended up on legendary bootleg albums such as Ultra Rare Tracks. Also, some of the visitors managed to smuggle tape recorders past Abbey Road security, and these would end up as bootlegs too. But the success of the show convinced EMI that an album of unreleased Beatles material would sell, and work began on track selection for an album. The man tasked with mixing the tapes and transferring them onto the new digital medium was the Beatles' original recording engineer, Jeff Emmerich. This he did at George Martin's Air Studios both in London and on the Caribbean island of Montserrat. Well, why not? The results were better than anyone at EMI had hoped for, and they quickly green-lighted the project to the next stage. Leave My Kitten Alone had been recorded by the Beatles on August the 14th, 1964, during a session for their fourth album, Beatles for Sale. It was, however, left off the album to give George his lead vocal track of Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby. The song had originally been recorded by Little Willie John in 1959 and released on King Records in the States, and coincidentally on Parlophone in the UK. However, the Beatles version was most likely based on Johnny Preston's version, which came out as a single on Mercury in 1961. As I mentioned before, the song was originally planned as a single in 1980, but now it seemed the perfect choice for the lead-off single for the Sessions album. Parlophone R6088 was given a release date of January the 28th, 1985, but in the end never got as far as the pressing plant. Capital, however, did get as far as printing some picture sleeves, which are highly collectible today. Leave My Kitten Alone is one of fans and my favourite originally unreleased Beatles recordings, and is one which I think really deserves a new mix to replace the muddy, messy one which ended up on Anthology 1. The final lineup for Sessions consisted of 13 tracks. Side 1 kicked off with Paul's demo for Badfinger of his song Come and Get It, recorded during the Abbey Road sessions. Track 2 was Leave My Kitten Alone, followed by a heavily edited version of George's Not Guilty, which had been recorded but left off the White Album. Track 4 is Paul's early version of I'm Looking Through You from Rubber Soul, with a final track on side one being an edit of John's What's the New Mary Jane from the August 68 White Album sessions. Side 2 opened up with the song George Martin had wanted to be their debut single, How Do You Do It? This was recorded on September the 4th, 1962, the same date as the Ringo on drums version of Love Me Do. Track 2 on side 2, Basame Mucho, dates from their very first EMI session on June the 6th, 1962, and includes Pete Best on drums. This is followed by a recording of One After 909, made on March the 5th, 1963, at the end of the From Me To You session, and of course went on to be re-recorded for the Let It Be album. It wouldn't be a true Beatles album without a track from Ringo, and his contribution to this album was the frankly terrible If You've Got Trouble from February 1965, which was wisely left off the Help album. Track 5 is another of my favourite previously unreleased Beatles songs, That Means A Lot. Unable to complete it to anyone's satisfaction, it was eventually given away to PJ Proby, who although managed to work it into something releasable, couldn't make it a hit. For me, this is one of their most enigmatic songs of this period, and one which I wish they could have completed. What do you think? Let me and everyone else know in the comments. Track 6 on side 2 is another of the album's highlights, George's acoustic While My Guitar Gently Weeps, which is followed by John singing a cover of a Buddy Holly song, Mailman Bring Me No More Blues, from the Get Back album sessions. 
The album comes to an end with an edited version of Christmas Time Is Here Again, originally used on the 1967 fan club flexi-disc. This is how most collectors know this album today, but this was not the design EMI originally chose. That featured a moody black and white shot taken in the alleyway at the side of Abbey Road Studios by Terry O'Neill on July the 1st, 1963, just before the Beatles began recording She Loves You. The rear panel featured a clever shot by Robert Freeman of the Beatles' boots, each with their names written inside. The album was duly assigned with Parlophone and Capital Catalogue numbers, and a release date was set for February the 25th, 1985, George Harrison's 42nd birthday. In this press release dated the 19th of December, 1984, EMI were keen to play down the rumour that they were sitting on a goldmine of unreleased material. And whilst acknowledging the existence of numerous BBC recordings and publishers' demos, stressed that these were never delivered to EMI. Also included in the press kit were two black and white promo photos for use with the Leave My Kitten Alone single and five for use with the album. It also included two colour transparencies, the first being what they called a spotlight shot taken at EMI's offices in Manchester Square in early 1964. The session also produced this great shot, seen here on the cover of a 1981 compilation from Czechoslovakia. The second was an outtake from the Sgt. Pepper cover shoot session. This, the press release pointed out, dispelled the rumour that Paul McCartney had been replaced at that session by Mal Evans. They even included a copy of an excerpt from the book The Long and Winding Road to back up that fact. Another interesting item in the kit is a list of questions and answers, which EMI thought were the most likely to be asked by the press. One of the most interesting questions on the crib sheet was, did you ask the Beatles permission to release this record? How did they react? Have they stopped it being released in the past? EMI's set answer to that question was this. This is subject to the suggested letters being sent to George and Ringo outlining our plans. Each of the Beatles are aware of this release and we haven't received any reaction at all. As we have never suggested such a release in the past, the question of stopping its release has never arisen. Now, the album was originally scheduled for release in November 1984, but was reportedly held back so as not to interfere with the sales of Paul's Give My Regards to Broad Street, which had been released on October the 22nd. But that excuse masked a bigger issue facing EMI, which was one that would spell the end of their control over the Beatles' recordings. In December 1984, relations between the Beatles and EMI had hit an all-time low, as both parties found themselves embroiled in a high court battle over unpaid royalties. In the case, Apple claimed that EMI had underpaid them by as much as £2.3 million, which with backdated interest amounted to as much as £4 million, a figure which would be closer to £16 million today. And for good measure, the Beatles were also suing Capital in America for the same reason, but for the much larger sum of £37 million. So with that in mind, it was no surprise that when EMI did eventually hear back from the Beatles, it was a solid no, and they had no choice but to cancel the album. It would then be another decade before fans could finally, officially, hear these tracks. The press kit ended up selling for an incredible £8,000, which, including fees, comes closer to £10,000, or nearly $13,000, which must make it the most expensive press kit in the world. I hope you enjoyed hearing about the Sessions album and that you'll tell me what you think about it in the comments. I'll be back next week with some more fascinating Beatles stories. In the meantime, why not subscribe or browse some of our other 200 plus Beatles videos on YouTube? Or you can visit us on social media. Links for all that are in the description. Also, if you're looking to buy some great sounding official Beatles vinyl, head on over to our website, parlogramauctions.com. But that's all for this one, so I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching.